Every Tuesday for the next six weeks, you can hear a series of eyewitness accounts of some memorable moments of history from the 17th to the 20th century. The programs have been compiled by James Hewitt and are introduced by John Gabriel. He begins today with the story of the Great Fire of London. During five days in September 1666, fire destroyed four-fifths of the city of London. London, overcrowded and built mainly of wood, had been living with the danger of fire for several centuries. There had been a destructive fire in 1135 and another in 1657, but their fury was small beside that of the Great Fire of 1666. It began in the early hours of a Sunday morning at Farrimer's, the King's Baker in Pudding Lane. Samuel Pepys, in his celebrated diary, tells us that he was awakened at three o'clock that morning by an excited maidservant. So I rose and slipped on my nightgown and went to her window, and thought the fire to be on the back side of Mark Lane at the farthest. But being unused to such fires as followed, I thought it far enough off, and so went to bed again and to sleep. About seven, rose again to dress myself, and there looked out at the window and saw the fire not so much as it was, and further off. By and by, Jane comes and tells me that she hears that above three hundred houses have been burned down by the fire we saw, and that it is now burning down all Fish Street by London Bridge. So I made myself ready presently, and walked to the tower, and there got up upon one of the high places, and there I did see the houses at that end of the bridge all on fire, and an infinite great fire on this, and the other side, the end of the bridge. So down with my heart full of trouble to the lieutenant of the tower, who tells me that it begun this morning in the King's Baker's house in Pudding Lane. Farimer, the King's Baker, and his family had been awakened about midnight to find their house and bakery full of smoke on the way downstairs, cut off by flames. They clambered out of a top window and along a gutter to the house next door and safety. A maidservant, frozen with fear, refused to follow and became the first victim of the fire. So I down to the waterside, and there got a boat and through bridge, and there saw a lamentable fire. Everybody endeavouring to remove their goods and flinging into the river or bringing them into lighters that lay off, poor people staying in their houses as long as till the very fire touched them, and then running into boats or clambering from one pair of stairs by the waterside to another. And the poor pigeons were loath to leave their houses, but hovered about the windows and balconies till they, some of them, burned their wings and fell down. Having stayed, and in an hour's time seen the fire rage every way, and nobody to my sight endeavouring to quench it, but to remove their goods and leave all to the fire, and having seen it get as far as Steel Yard, and the wind mighty high and driving it into the city, and everything after so long a drought proving combustible, even the very stones of the churches, I to Whitehall, and there up to the king's closet in the chapel. I did tell the king and the Duke of York what I saw, and that unless his majesty did command houses to be pulled down, nothing could stop the fire. They seemed much troubled, and the king commanded me to go to the Lord Mayor from him, and command him to spare no houses, but to pull down before the fire every way. The Lord Mayor, Sir Thomas Bloodworth, had been called at 3 a.m. He took a sleepy look at the fire, remarked that it did not seem of much importance, and disappeared from the scene for several hours, presumably, like Pepys, to his bed. Not so a clergyman, the Reverend Thomas Vincent, who roamed the burning streets tirelessly and looked upon the fire as the judgment of God. Fire! Fire! Fire doth resound the streets. Many citizens start out of their sleep, look out of their windows. Some dress themselves and run to the place. The Lord Mayor of the city comes with his officers. A confusion there is. Council is taken away. And London, so famous for wisdom and dexterity, can now find neither brains nor hands to prevent its ruin. The Lord Mayor reappeared on the streets shortly after dawn. If he had even then 
given the command to dynamite houses in the path of the fire, it is possible that the great disaster could have been checked. But he fretted about who would pay for rebuilding the houses if they were blown up, and about the legal responsibilities when he had not got an owner's consent. The result was disastrous. The timber was bone dry from a long spell without rain, and an east wind blew the flames into the city. Now the fire gets mastery and burns dreadfully, and God with his great bellows blows upon it. William Taswell, aged 12 years, in process of becoming a King's Scholar at Westminster School, was not aware that anything was amiss until between 10 and 11 o'clock that Sunday morning, as he stood on the steps leading up to the pulpit in Westminster Abbey. I perceived some people below me running to and fro in consternation. Immediately almost, a report reached my ears that London was in conflagration. Without any ceremony, I took my leave of the preacher, and having ascended Parliament steps near the Thames, I soon perceived four boats crowded with objects of distress. These had escaped from the fire scarce under any other covering except that of a blanket. The wind was blowing strong eastward. The flames at last reached Westminster. I saw great flakes carried up into the air, at least three furlongs. These at last, pitching upon and uniting themselves to various dry substances, set on fire houses very remote from each other. Pepys, on taking leave of the King, had made his way to Old St Paul's and down Watling Street. I saw every creature coming away loaden with goods to save, and here and there sick people carried away in beds. Extraordinary good goods carried in carts and on backs. At last met my Lord Mayor in Canning Street, like a man spent with a handkerchief about his neck. To the King's message he cried like a fainting woman, Lord, what can I do? I am spent. People will not obey me. I have been pulling down houses, but the fire overtakes us faster than we can do it that he needed no more soldiers, and that he must go and refresh himself, having been up all night. Rumours spread even more rapidly than the fire. One was that an army of 4,000 Frenchmen and Papists was on its way to attack burning London. It was being said, too, that Frenchmen and Papists had been setting fire to houses. A blacksmith, in my presence, meeting an innocent Frenchman walking along the street, felled him instantly to the ground with an iron bar. I could not help seeing the innocent blood flowing in a plentiful stream down to his ankles. In another place, I saw the incensed populace divesting a French painter of all the goods he had in his shop, and after having helped him off with many other things, levelling his house to the ground under the pretense that they thought he was desirous of setting his own house on fire. My brother told me he saw a Frenchman almost dismembered in Moorfields because he carried balls of fire in a chest with him, when in truth they were only tennis balls. Pepys had some friends to dinner and did not allow the fire to spoil his appetite. An extraordinary good dinner. Soon as dined, I away and walked through the city, with streets full of nothing but people and horses and carts loaden with goods ready to run over one another and removing goods from one burned house to another. At Paul's Wharf I had appointed a boat to attend me, met with the King and Duke of York in their barge. Their order was only to pull down houses apace, and so below bridge at the waterside. But little was or could be done, the fire coming upon them so fast. Good hopes there was of stopping it at the three cranes above, and at Butolf's Wharf, below bridge, if care be used, but the wind carries it into the city, so as we know not by the waterside what it do there. He had an appointment in Whitehall, but soon returned to his boat on the river. So near the fire as we could for smoke, and all over the Thames, with one's face in the wind, you were almost burned with a shower of fire drops, so as houses were burned by these drops and flakes of fire, Three or four, nay, five or six houses, one from another. When we could endure no more upon the water, we to a little alehouse on the bankside, and there stayed 
till it was dark almost, and saw the fire grow. And as it grew darker, appeared more and more, and in corners and upon steeples and between churches and houses, as far as we could see up the hill of the city, in a most horrid, malicious, bloody flame, not like the flame of an ordinary fire. We stayed till, it being darkish, we saw the fire as only one entire arch of fire from this to the other side of the bridge, and in a bow up the hill for an arch of above a mile long. It made me weep to see it. The churches, houses, and all on fire and flashing at once, and a horrid noise the flames made, and the cracking of houses at their ruin. Monday, September the 3rd. About four o'clock in the morning, my Lady Batten sent me a cart to carry away all my money and plate and best things to Sir William Ryder's at Bednall Green, which I did, riding myself in my nightgown in the cart. And, Lord, to see how the streets and the highways are crowded with people running and riding and getting on carts at any rate to fetch away things. I find Sir William Ryder tired with being called up all night and receiving things from several friends. His house full of goods. I am eased at my heart to have my treasure so well secured. Another celebrated diarist, John Evelyn, went to the bankside in Southwark on Monday evening to view the spectacle of the great fire. I saw the whole south part of the city burning from Cheapside to the Thames. The conflagration was so universal and the people so astonished that from the beginning they hardly stirred to quench it but ran about like distracted creatures. It burned churches, public halls, the exchange, hospitals, monuments and ornaments, leaping after a prodigious manner from house to house and street to street at great distances one from the other. I saw the Thames covered with goods floating, all the barges and boats laden with what some had time and courage to save, as on the other side the carts, etc., carrying out to the fields, which for many miles were strewed with movables of all sorts, and tents erecting to shelter both people and what goods they could get away with. All the sky was of a fiery aspect, like the top of a burning oven, and the light seen above forty miles round about for many nights. The noise and cracking and thunder of the impetuous flames, the shrieking of women and children, the hurry of people, the fall of towers, houses and churches, was like a hideous storm. And the air all about was so hot and inflamed that at the last one was not able to approach it, but was forced to stand still and let the flames burn on, which they did for near two miles in length and one in breadth. The clouds also of smoke were dismal and reached, upon computation, near fifty miles in length. Thus I left London burning, the resemblance of Sodom, or the last day. Thus it seemed, too, to the Reverend Thomas Vincent, who saw the Royal Exchange burn fiercely. The Royal Exchange itself, the glory of the merchants, is now invaded with much violence. And when once the fire was entered, how quickly did it run round the galleries, filling them with flames, then cometh down the stairs, compasseth the walks, giving forth flaming volleys, and filleth the court with sheets of fire. By and by, down fall all the kings upon their faces, and the greatest part of the stone building after them, with such a noise as was dreadful and astonishing. Then, then the city did shake indeed, and the inhabitants did tremble, and flew away in great anguish from their houses. Rattle, rattle, rattle was the noise which the fire struck upon the ear, as if there had been a thousand iron chariots beating upon the stones. And if you opened your eyes to the opening of the street where the fire was come, you might see in some places whole streets at once in flames that issued forth as if they had been so many great forges from the opposite windows, which, folding together, were united together in one great flame throughout the whole street. And then you might see the houses tumble, 
tumble, tumble from one end of the street to the other with a great crash, leaving the foundations open to the view of the heavens. Meanwhile, the king's scholars had not been idle. John Dolben, Bishop of Rochester and Dean of Westminster, collected his scholars together in a company, marching with them on foot to put a stop, if possible, to the conflagration. We were employed many hours in fetching water from the back side of St Dunstan's Church in the east, where we happily extinguished the fire. It could not be expected that my father's house should escape this almost general conflagration. They shared the same fate with others. But what rendered our loss still greater was this. Certain persons, assuming the character of porters, but in reality nothing else but downright plunderers, came and offered their assistance in removing our goods. We accepted, but they so far availed themselves of our service as to steal goods to the value of 40 pounds from us. Tuesday, September the 4th. Up by break of day to get away the remainder of my things, which I did by lighter. It was afternoon before we could get them all away. Then Sir William Penn and I to Tower Street and there met the fire coming on in that narrow street on both sides with infinite fury. Sir William Batten, not knowing how to remove his wine, did dig a pit in the garden and laid it in there, and I took the opportunity of laying all the papers of my office that I could not otherwise dispose of. And in the evening, Sir William Penn and I did dig another and put our wine in it, and I, my parmesan cheese, as well as my wine and some other things. Mrs. Turner and her husband supped with my wife and I at night in the office upon a shoulder of mutton, without any napkin or anything in a sad manner, but were merry. Only now and then, walking into the garden, saw how horridly the sky looks, all on a fire in the night. It was enough to put us out of our wits, and indeed it was extremely dreadful for it looks just as if it was at us, and the whole heaven on fire. Two beautiful buildings were ablaze, and impossible to save. It was amazing to see how the fire had spread itself several miles in compass. And amongst other things that night, the sight of the Guild Hall was a fearful spectacle, which stood the whole body of it together in view, for several hours together, after the fire had taken it. Without flames, I suppose, because the timber was such solid oak, in a bright shining coal, as if it had been a palace of gold, or a great building of burnished brass. For a time, old St Paul's was ringed by fire, but miraculously surviving. Then, shortly after sunset, its top caught fire. Young Taswell was an eyewitness. Just after sunset, I went to the Royal Bridge in New Palace Yard at Westminster to take a fuller view of the fire. As I stood upon the bridge among others, I could not but observe the gradual approach of fire towards that venerable fabric. About eight o'clock, it broke out on the top of St Paul's Church, already scorched by the violent heat of the air and lightning too, and before nine, blazed so conspicuous as to enable me to read very clearly a 16 mo edition of Terence, which I carried in my pocket. Now the lead melts and runs as if it had been snow before the sun, and with a great noise fall on the pavement and break through into Faith Church beneath, and great flakes of stone scale and peel off strangely from the side of the walls. Wednesday, September the 5th. I lay down in the office again, being mighty weary, and sore in my feet with going, till I was hardly able to stand. About two in the morning, my wife calls me up and tells me of new cries of fire, it being come to Barking Church, which is at the bottom of our lane. I up and finding it so, resolved presently to take her away, and did, and took my gold, which was about two thousand three hundred and fifty pounds by boat to Woolwich. But, Lord, what a sad sight it was by moonlight to see the whole city almost on fire, that you might see it plain at Woolwich, as if you were by it. There, when I come, I find the gate shut, but no guard kept at all, 
which troubled me, because of discourse now begun that there is a plot in it, and that the French had done it. I got the gates open, and to Mr. Sheldon's, where I locked up my gold, and charged my wife and a servant never to leave the room without one of them in it, day or night. So back again, by the way, seeing my goods well in the lighters at Deptford, and watched well by people. Home. And whereas I expected to see our house on fire, it now being about seven o'clock, it was not. But to the fire, and there find greater hopes than I expected, for my confidence of finding our office on fire was such that I durst not ask anybody how it was with us, till I come and saw it was not burned. The strong east wind had at last died down, and the fire's destruction was being checked by the dynamiting of houses and buildings, a method that should have been employed much earlier, as Evelyn points out. On September the 5th, the fire crossed towards Whitehall, and oh, the confusion there was then at the court. It pleased His Majesty to command me, among the rest, to look after the quenching of Fetter Lane End, to preserve, if possible, that part of Holborn, whilst the rest of the gentlemen took their several posts. For now they began to bestir themselves, and began to consider that nothing was likely to put a stop to the fire, but the blowing up of so many houses as might make a wider gap than any had yet been made by the ordinary method of pulling them down with engines. This some stout seamen proposed early enough to have saved near the whole city, but this some tenacious and avaricious men, aldermen, etc., would not permit, because their houses must have been of the first. It was therefore now commanded to be practised. It now pleased God, by abating the wind, and by the industry of the people, when almost all was lost, infusing a new spirit into them, so that the fury of it began to abate about noon. The poor inhabitants were dispersed about St. George's Fields and Moorfields as far as Highgate, and several miles in circle, some under tents, some under miserable huts and hovels, many without a rag or any necessary utensils, bed or board who from delicateness, riches, and easy accommodations in stately and well-furnished houses were now reduced to extremist misery and poverty. The great fire of London at last nearly spent, our eyewitnesses viewed the scorched ruins and collected souvenirs. My feet ready to burn, walking through the town among the hot coals, Fenchurch Street, Gracious Street, and Lombard Street all in dust, the exchange a sad sight, nothing standing there of all the statues or pillars but Sir Thomas Gresham's picture in the corner. Walked into Moorfields, and find that full of people and poor wretches carrying their goods there, and everybody keeping his goods together by themselves. Drank there, and paid two pence for a plain penny loaf. Thence homeward, having passed through Cheapside and Newgate Market, all burned, and took up a piece of glass of Mercer's Chapel in the street, where much more was, so melted and buckled with the heat of the fire, like parchment. I also did see a poor cat taken out of a hole in the chimney, joining to the wall of the exchange, with the hair all burned off the body, and yet alive. So home at night, and find there Good hopes of saving our office. Young Taswell took his souvenirs at Old St Paul's. On Thursday, soon after sunrising, I endeavoured to reach St Paul's. The ground so hot as almost to scorch my shoes, and the air so intensely warm that unless I had stopped some time upon Fleet Bridge to rest myself, I must have fainted. After giving myself time to breathe, I made the best of my way to St. Paul's. And now let any person judge of the violent emotion I was in when I perceived the metal belonging to the bells melting. The ruinous condition of its walls, whole heaps of stone of a large circumference tumbling down with a great noise just upon my feet, ready to crush me to death. 
I prepared myself for returning back again, having first loaded my pockets with several pieces of bell metal. I forgot to mention that near the east wall of St. Paul's, a human body presented itself to me, parched up as it were with the flames, whole as to skin, meagre as to flesh, yellow as to colour. This was an old, decrepit woman who fled here for safety, imagining the flames would not have reached her there. Her clothes were burnt, and every limb reduced to coal. On my way home, I saw several engines on fire, and those concerned with them escaping with great eagerness from the flames, which spread instantaneously, almost like a wildfire. And at last, accoutred with my sword and helmet, which I picked up among many others in the ruins, I traversed this torrid zone back again. Our final look at devastated London is with John Evelyn, who went out on Friday morning. Nearly a week had passed since the fire began at the bakery in Pudding Lane. I went from Whitehall as far as London Bridge, through the late Fleet Street, Ludgate Hill by St Paul's, Cheapside, Exchange, Bishopsgate, Aldersgate, and out to Moorfields, thence through Cornhill, etc. With extraordinary difficulty, clambering over heaps of yet smoking rubbish and frequently mistaking where I was, the ground under my feet so hot that it even burnt the soles of my shoes. In the meantime, His Majesty got to the tower by water to demolish the houses about the graft, which being built entirely about it, had they taken fire and attacked the white tower where the magazine of powder lay, would undoubtedly not only have beaten down and destroyed all the bridge, but sunk and torn the vessels in the river and rendered the demolition beyond all expression for several miles about the country. At my return, I was infinitely concerned to find that goodly church, St. Paul's, now a sad ruin, that beautiful portico now rent in pieces, flakes of large stones split asunder, nothing remaining entire but the inscription showing by whom it was built, which had not one letter of it defaced. It was astonishing to see what immense stones the heat had in a manner calcined, so that all the ornaments, columns, friezes, capitals, and projectures of massy Portland stone flew off, even to the very roof, where a sheet of lead covering a great space, no less than six acres by measure, was totally melted. Thus lay in ashes that most venerable church, besides near one hundred more. The lead, ironwork, bells, plate, etc., melted the exquisitely wrought Mercer's Chapel, the sumptuous exchange, the august fabric of Christ's Church, all the rest of the company's halls, splendid buildings, arches, entries, all in dust. So that in five or six miles traversing about, I did not see one load of timber unconsumed, nor many stones, but what were calcined white as snow. The people who now walked about the ruins appeared like men in some dismal desert, or rather, in some great city laid waste by a cruel enemy. Four-fifths of the city of London was in ruins, including most of its finest buildings. Fortunately, the death toll had been light, but over 100,000 people had lost their homes. King Charles II proclaimed that country people were to bring produce into London to feed the homeless. The spirit of the people, which had been successively assailed by the plague and by fire, remained unbroken. Within a week, the king and his council had been presented with plans for a new city of London. Those eyewitness accounts of the great fire of London were read by Peter Pratt as Samuel Pepys, Victor Lucas as the Reverend Thomas Vincent, Joe Manning Wilson as William Taswell, and Godfrey Kenton as John Evelyn. The program was compiled by James Hewitt, introduced by John Gabriel, 
and produced by Margaret Ettall.